Hello, everyone. My name is Andy Fingerhut. I am uh, formerly of Cisco Systems, a principal engineer. I am currently uh, self-employed and, and transitioning to my next role. Wait, wait and see the space to see what that is later, probably the next P4 workshop. And uh, I've been doing data plane development uh, at Cisco and many areas in router and switch design for most of the last 20 years there at Cisco. So I've uh, gotten an intense interest in P4 through that and uh, wish I had designed it myself and now I get to help. So I'm, I've been a member of the language design work group for the last three years and am planning to talk first here about giving a little bit of background of how the language has evolved so far and some possibilities of where it might be going uh, soon. So let's start. All right. So I've divided up to past, present, and future. Nice division. No, uh, I'm not trying to steal from Mr. Dickens, but uh, it's a good structure. So let's see. Um, so P414 was released in 2014. They got, I think they, uh, I wasn't actually involved at the time, but I believe they actually got that year right. And um, I wasn't involved at this time, and so I don't have much of a description here, but there were several new versions of the language developed variants of P414. Um, and at some point, uh, within a, a year and a half, two years or so, they decided they were going to name that P416 instead of some version of P414. So the first one of those, we slightly missed uh, the window. We got to May 2017 for the first release of the P416 specification. 18 months later, we got a version 1.1 out. And then since then, we've been trying to, um, the language design work group has kind of made a decision. We, we were hoping to try to keep maybe a once or twice a year cadence of releasing new versions even if that means sometimes they'll be smaller. So I'm gonna go through and just hit some of the highlights. Um, I'll try to keep a balance between not mentioning the, the most minor updates. Um, you can look at the spec and look at the update section. Uh, there's a revision history in the back if you're, you're curious about all the details, but I'm, I'm trying to hit what I think are, are the biggest features. Um, so when version 1.1 came out, um, part of what it was doing was catching up to things that wasn't in the 1.0 version of the spec, but P414 already had. And it just, there didn't seem to be quite enough time to get into that version 1.0. So for example, saturated arithmetic, you want to add two numbers and you don't want it to wrap around, was already in P414, hadn't quite made it into P416 yet. Parser value sets, where you have a parser and um, uh, you want to be able to, it's often used for things like ethernet types and you want to have two or three or a dozen ethernet types that are all treated the same way and you want to be configurable from the control plane. And like a little tiny table in the parser. Um, and there were some new things for programmer convenience. So functions, more like a C function. Um, optional and name parameters, if you get up to controls or actions that can have a large number of parameters, it can be very convenient uh, as a developer to be able to leave some out and or give them a different order with explicit names. And then there were, uh, enum types already in the original language, enumerated types, um, they had a little bit of a difficulty in that there wasn't a good way in the data plane code and the P4 code to translate them between that and something you could stick into a header. Or, uh, um, and so there was a new enumerated type that you explicitly specified you wanted it some bit representation for it, which makes the translation there trivial. And then another common theme that's been added, uh, we'll see uh, in other added in, in the versions of language later is things specifically targeted making uh, more information passed from the text of the P4 program into an automatically generated control plane API. And so the first of these uh, that I'll describe is uh, there was the type keyword added in this version. And the motivating use case there was you could, for example, have switch port IDs, Ethernet or IP addresses and declare them a new type for them, a type name for them with a type keyword. And type def already existed, but type was a kind of a stronger way to make sure that um, they, uh, we, we didn't, the, the compiler could keep these values straight and maintain annotations with them and mark them that way when you generate a control plane API. So you know that this is the control plane, you know this is an Ethernet address, this is a switch port ID, not just some nine bit wide thing. Um, and structured annotations, which were a way of taking uh, the annotations that you can add in a P416 program and uh, restrict them to a simple list of values or a dictionary of key value pairs, which covered most of the use cases that people cared about um, 
when they're writing control plane software, when they want to annotate objects like tables and actions. And this restriction actually made them a little bit easier to parse and consume on the control plane side. So version 1.2, there were a dozen other things that I'm not going to mention here, but they tended to be a bit sm even smaller than these. Um, and uh, this release, so uh, finally got size of header. Um, before this, you actually had to say, uh, define a constant to say your ethernet header was 14 bytes, your IPv4 header was 20 bytes long. Now you could just say size of whatever header you defined and it'll, the compiler will calculate it for you for fixed size headers. A, a nice programmer convenience thing, something that you feel when you miss, <laughs> not when it's there. And uh, when it's not there, you feel it. And for the control plane API, a string type was added, not for data plane use, purely just for control plane API annotations. A lot of other smaller things, which I won't get into, but but they were, I, I've looked through the, myself a list and they were, uh, a lot of them were pretty minor. Um, so as part of this faster cadence, the last release was last October and the, the next one I believe will be late this month, either either shortly before May or probably during May. And the numbering is 1.2.1 to reflect that. And the main thing that's been added in are here. There's a few other minor things, but um, basically a literal, a literal syntax to make it nicer to assign values to structs with name, again, key equals value pairs or field name equals value pairs. And then a couple of annotations that make it nicer for the compiler to know that some um, extern function or extern method is a pure thing with no side effects. There's a slight variation you can look at in the spec for what the difference is between these two things. Um, but basically, they, they're, they're both there to help mark externs as letting the compiler front end earlier know that it can do various kinds of reordering or uh, elimination tricks, um, optimization tricks. All right, so the present is brief, present is fleeting. Um, this is one of my favorite quotes about the future. I'm sure a lot of people have seen it. Yogi Berra. He's got a lot of great quotes. You can go look him up on a, any good quote site. So here's a possible P4 futures. Um, my crystal ball is um, maybe a little bit better than the average person's who's not a language design work group only because I spent a lot of time thinking about things there and make some of them happen. Um, and have seen a lot of the things that are people interested in, but um, you know, no promises here. Um, so going forward, uh, more day-to-day -day programmer conveniences, things like the structured valued expressions, more kinds of syntactic sugar and other things that just help it'd be more convenient to write um, you know, the work at eight programs that, that people need to write um, for uh, data plane development. And then there's some kind of bigger things on the horizon that people have had in mind for actually years. And it's just been there, they could be a lot of work. It could be fairly subtle to develop them and get them right. And there could be a lot of discussion when these things come up. So uh, they can, that can also slow them down a bit, but a module system, something for let's say isolating names like packages in Python or other similar languages that can separate namespaces and generic types which you can use to say plug in I want let's say a bloom filter and I want it to have this many entries versus that many entries or this size of field versus that size of field or v v4 fields versus v6 addresses but all the other code is common it can be useful for uh, making code a bit more reusable those those will probably still take some time I doubt they'll be in the next point release but they're on the horizon. They're always they are being pushed forward a bit. Um, so as far as other things that I think are uh, exciting, there's been you know announcements from more companies interested in developing using P4 to help uh, develop software for programmable NICs. Pensando made an announcement. Uh, Barefoot was acquired by Intel in the last year, and Intel is doing a lot of NIC development. Um, no, I'm not announcing anything here. Just uh, I don't know any announcements to make, but uh, there's there's definitely a lot of interest there. And this could, I think this could definitely drive new language features to take advantage of their capabilities. Um, in the Nix, there's a lot more stateful features closer to the hosts. Um, a couple of things that I've, that, that I could e easily see coming in sometime would be some form of loop, perhaps one that's, you know, uh, in order to keep it more manageable, maybe a, a compile time maximum known number of iterations, maybe arrays that you can iterate over. Um, another thing that's commonly asked about that might be even more useful in a NIC is a table where if you uh, get a miss, you can add an entry to it right in the data plane code without having to bother some control plane software somewhere. It can be a much lower latency way of getting that new entry in before another packet arrives. Um, externs have been in P416 since the beginning. 
um, they cover a lot of the use cases for some of the fancier stateful features that one might imagine um, adding to that existing NICs do have and that you might want to put programmable things around them or near them, um, even if you don't necessarily implement them in P4. Um, and I think that uh, there's some interest in restarting the, there was a portable switch architecture group, so, um, and starting up the a portable NIC architecture, there's some interest in, in doing that and seeing if that can be pushed forward. And I think there's at least as much work there in defining new externs, new architectures uh, in the language versus actually changing the language itself. These are sort of extension mechanisms already built into the first version of the language that are great for these kinds of extensions and add-ons. Um, of course, there'll be the Java object system with garbage collection, um, class implementation, inheritance interfaces. Okay, now I get to smile because I didn't mean any of that. That was entirely meant to see if I could do that with a straight face. Um, P4 should stay true to its roots. Um, it really is intended for high-speed data planes. A big P4 program is five to 10,000 lines long, and that would be about as large as I expect them to get for quite a while, personally. Um, so these kinds of things, uh, these are really not the, uh, the bread and butter of, of a specialized device that P4 targets. So just a joke. I don't, I don't think anybody will get far with these, any of these proposed features. But if you have ideas for features and you're interested in it, the P4 language design work group welcomes participation. Give us, uh, send, it, send an email to the, the chairs and say what you're interested in and they'll be happy to talk and invite you in. That is all I have for my talk today. Our next speaker is uh, Eric Campbell from Cornell University. Eric, take it away, please. Awesome. <clears throat> Thanks for that talk. Uh, let me steal the screen from you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So as Andy said, my name is Eric Campbell, and I'm a PhD student at Cornell University. And today I'm going to talk about a tool that I've developed called Avenir, which is a way to future-proof the control plane via data plane synthesis. So Avenir exists in the context of software-defined networking, uh, which relies on a few key abstractions. Uh, the first is a separated control plane and a data plane. Uh, and the control plane communicates with a bunch of networking applications via some high-level abstractions, which then get translated into a southbound API for managing uh, the actual physical data plane. And in historical software-defined networking, the physical data plane uh, has been comprised of identical switches. They were sort of, uh, they were all open flow. You know, you can think of it that way. Uh, but in a modern version of software-defined networking, we want to support heterogeneous devices. We want to support devices that uh, that run different protocols that implement different P4 programs, say, but are all controlled by the same controller. And so in this sense, the controller has to play a slightly more complicated role. It has to abstract the, the networking applications. Uh, it has to abstract the physical devices away for the networking applications. So the networking applications can still write their code against this high level abstractions that then get translated into the physical operations that get executed on the, the devices. And this has a couple of goals. Obviously, the first one is this switch heterogeneity that allows you to uh, modify your, uh, your network and upgrade your physical devices without requiring the historical forklift style upgrades. Uh, and it's also future proof in the same way. You can, you can upgrade and, and modify your physical network without having to trigger these massive uh, rewrites in the controller or in the applications. Okay, so what's the state of the art? The state of the art right now is that the controllers are equipped with specific plugins or specific drivers, which are software that you write, that a programmer has to write to handle these different architectures. So if I want to make a change to my P4 program on the switch, I have to uh, modify the software driver. Or if I want to introduce a new, completely new architecture, then again, I have to spend lots of cycles, lots of development cycles in order to design, program, debug, test, uh, and, and push this driver for my, my new switch architecture. 
And this doesn't maintain this goal of, of a future-proof controller. Uh, if I have to write software to handle new hardware, that's, that's really kind of a, uh, a bit of a downer. Uh, it's, a, it's a hindrance to progress. It's a hindrance to upgrading this physical network. So what does a future-proof controller look like? Well, that's where Avenir comes in. Avenir is a tool that is an automatic runtime translator that exposes a single abstract switch to the controller and automatically translates the controller's operations to that, run, to that abstract switch into the myriad physical devices that run in the real network. And because it's automatic, it does maintain both this heterogeneous goal and this future-proof goal. We're allowed to upgrade individual devices sort of freely and automatically because we don't have to write the software that's required uh, in previous sort of Onos Trellis stratum technologies. Okay, so this seems a bit, a bit like a pipe dream. What's the technology? How do we do it? Well, we use a technique from programming languages and formal methods called program synthesis. And the way that that works is sort of this two-stage algorithm. In the first stage, we verify the correctness of an existing solution. And this might just be, you know, the empty, the empty physical switch with no operations having been executed on. We, we check to see if that implements the same function as the, as the abstract program. And that generates a counterexample if it doesn't hold. If it does, we're done. Like if, if we can prove that the solution is correct, then we, we finish. Otherwise, we get a counterexample, uh, which we then use to modify the solution. We use this to figure out more control, uh, more data plane operations, more physical data plane operations to, to operate on the switch. And then that gives us a new candidate implementation, and we verify correctness of that and continue. Experts may recognize this as sort of something specific called counterexample guided inductive synthesis. And our specific version of this has two really key properties. The first is something called soundness, which says, of course, that every solution is correct. Uh, the other is completeness, which says that a solution is found whenever one exists. And so you can combine these two properties and really have a high degree of confidence, in fact, provable confidence, that you will get the result that you expect. Okay, so what I've, I've said that the solution is correct, but I haven't really told you what it means for a solution to be correct. What we mean by correctness is program equivalence. So we take our abstract switch and the abstract runtime operations that have been executed on it, we combine them together into a logical implementation. We do the same thing for the physical switch and for the physical runtime operations. And then we check whether they're equivalent using an off-the-shelf theorem prover like Z3 or Boulette. And if that theorem prover can prove that these two programs are equivalent, well, then we're done. We've, we've found a solution. If they're not, we're going to get a counterexample. And that counterexample is going to be an input-output packet pair. The input packet here in yellow uh, is the packet that's going to get input into the abstract switch. And uh, the blue packet on the right is the output of that switch. And so this specifies input-output behavior of the abstract switch that is not reflected in the physical switch. And so in order to extend the solution, to, in order to modify the physical switch to, uh, or sorry, the, in order to produce API calls that execute the same function, we will introduce something called program holes, uh, which are indicated by this question mark. And we, then we solve this equation. We use a heuristic guided search to replicate the input output behavior of the abstract switch in the physical switch. And once we search for these, these, these program holes, which correspond to runtime API calls, then we're going to go back to our verification stage, check again, and sort of continue in the algorithm that way. So the search for these, these these question marks, these program holes, is a heuristic search. And so you might ask the obvious question of how fast and how good are our heuristics? Well, we've done some preliminary experiments based on some data from the, from the ONF. The data that we have uh, captures a switch reboot test where uh, we, a switch has gone down and we want to reinsert the 40,000 routes into that switch. So our abstract program is fabric.p4. And the physical switch is a Broadcom switch. It's a P4 specification of the Broadcom switch. 
And so uh, these 40,000 insertions come into fabric.p4 over the course of about 15 minutes. Avenir takes about 32 minutes on top of that to process these 40,000 insertions. And now that seems like a lot, but really with only a 2x overhead, we're getting just above a 2x overhead, we're getting a certification that the program that we have is correct. We don't have to rely on testing and debugging. We have a true certification that this translation does the same thing on both switches. And this good performance that we have is due to the incrementality of our solving. Instead of trying to solve the problem for all 40,000 uh, routes at once, we break it up and we solve the problem for each route at a time. And so there are a couple of caveats to this, this good performance that we have. The first is that we're assuming that the parcels are equivalent. Lucky that's, luckily, that's almost true of these two programs, and so we only have to make a small, small changes. Uh, and the externs are man, manually modeled, so we don't have this capability of including uh, externs. We have to manually model them ourselves. And hashes are a bit tricky, so we use versions of these programs that don't require hashing. Regardless, we can still synthesize this many routes in a characteristic way to show feasibility of this approach. I can show you how feasible it is myself uh, with a little bit of a demo. So we can see here that I'm about to run the Avenir tool uh, with benchmarks from Onos. And I'm going to examine the first 1,000 rules. And uh, we've applied some optimizations here on the right. So let's, let's see what happens when we run it. And we're waiting for a second. And we're going. And here we're outputting some data. And finally, at the end, we see the, the, one, the 1,000 insertions that we've computed. We have, on the left, we see that these are insertions into the L3 forwarding table that match on the IPv6 address and set the output port uh, on the right-hand side. So the tool works. Uh, let's see if I can, there we go. And so to summarize, Avenir is an automatic runtime translator that sits between the controller and the data plane, exposing an abstract switch to the controller and translating the runtime operations to that switch into physical data plane operations for our physical switches. It allows for us to, to, to support a switch heterogeneity quite easily because it's automatic, as well as future proofs are, are our data plane to prevent the need for forklift upgrades in the future when we want to only upgrade certain pieces. So going through time, you can freely upgrade, freely modify, and freely support multiple architectures in your network with the verified confidence that your network and that your translation is correct. So thank you for having me. And I want to just take a moment to thank uh, a bunch of the collaborators that I've worked with and a bunch of people who I've had conversations with. Um, most notably, Priya Srikumar is an undergrad who has been, who's done some awesome work. And of course, my advisor, Nate Foster. Okay, so I think that's all I have. So uh, Tomas, I think is next. Yes, thank you, Eric. Uh, so hi, my name is Tomasz Krzyński. Uh, I'm R&D expert at Rolandstrasse Poland and also a PhD student at Warsaw University of Technology. And in my daily routine, I work mainly on uh, high performance solutions for NFB. And for that reason, we use P4 and the programmable switches to um, offload the VNFs uh, to improve the performance. So today I will talk about uh, our last year effort around P4 to user space BPF. And I will show how we can ext extend the user space packet processing pipeline at runtime. And let me introduce some context first. Uh, as we know, with the constant development of the P4 language, more and more programming targets are emerging. And even though the P4 was de designed more for hardware, uh, we have a number of uh, software targets that plays, play their, their role in the ecosystem. And if we look at them, we have a BNV2 software switch, which is a reference implementation for P4. There is also a PyCs uh, switch, which uh, allows us to generate the open VCH code from the P4 program. Uh, the P4 compiler has already support for the next generation Linux data path, such as eBPF uh, or XDP. And this talk is about a new uh, backend for P4, which is user space PPF, which provides a safe execution environment uh, for user space applications. And I will show it uh, the details uh, a bit later. Uh, but you may, uh, may ask why we need uh, another backend for P4. 
Um, in my daily routine, I work on, as I said, on high, uh, high performance solutions for NLV. And uh, as you may know, uh, the requirements are, uh, for network performance are quite uh, really high and quite different from the those for IT systems. And if we talk about the packet processing uh, in the NFV, there is a strict requirement on the throughput provided by the hypervisor switches. And if we look at the landscape of these uh, solutions, uh, there are mainly user space implementations because they provide uh, performance. And uh, however, uh, even though all these solutions are implemented in software, the packet processing pipeline is also quite fixed. Of course, the release cycle for these targets is uh, much shorter than for hardware devices, but still it requires uh, a strong development team uh, with the skills in, the, in C or C++ language and also a familiarity with a large code base of these solutions. So it may be difficult to achieve for some companies. And uh, therefore, we think that they may be uh, not extensible enough. And we need some runtime extensibility mechanisms that uh, will allow us to uh, develop a new uh, data plane programs uh, for new protocols for these uh, solutions and uh, inject uh, the new programs at runtime. And on the other hand, this solution must be safe because uh, it must prevent the crashes of the already uh, running uh, hypervisor switch. And here comes the UBPF as a solution to our problem, problems, uh, as it provides a safe execution environment and uh, uh, arbitrary packet processing applications can be injected to, to, to the virtual machine that it provides at runtime. And having this, uh, this uh, environment, uh, we developed a P4 compiler for it. Uh, so that the users can use it, uh, uh, can use our compiler to develop a new extensions in a high level language. Uh, before going to the into the details how we implemented that uh, compiler, I would like to quickly say about uh, user space between virtual machine. Um, this is the uh, project originated some time ago by the IUVisor community, and it provides a just-in-time compilation to x86 uh, architecture. It also provides a BPF verifier, which ensures the correctness of the program and its successful termination at the time the new program is being injected. Uh, it also provides a set of BPF maps, uh, which are a key value stores. And as the BPF, programs, uh, is, uh, BPF program is quite limited itself, it the, the virtual machine provides a set of helpers that allows program to communicate with uh, external subsystems. And if we compare the UBPF with much more popular eBPF, the internal implementation, the obvious difference is the level where the programs are being executed, but uh, the licensing model is also different because UBPF is licensed under uh, Apache 2 in, in comparison to GPL license of UBPF. And uh, the UBPF implements a much more thin uh, virtual machine, so uh, it's less complex, but it also does not provide uh, some advanced features. And as I, as I said, uh, based on that, we developed a P4 to user space BPF compiler. And basically, we took advantage of the modular design of the P4 compiler um, and implemented uh, that as a new subcomponent. As UBPF is quite similar to eBPF, we strongly based on the abstractions and methods provided uh, used for the eBPF backend. And we also make uh, heavy use of uh, BPF maps to implement P4 tables and registers. As for eBPF, we, uh, the compilation process is divided into two phases. Two phases. And the first phase is the translation from the P4 to the restricted uh, C uh, code that will, will be compatible with the BPF virtual machine. And it, in the second uh, stage, uh, the c compiler is used to generate the BPF byte code uh, and that can be used, uh, that can be injected to the uh, BPF virtual machine. If you look at the architecture that we design, architecture model, uh, this is really simple. Uh, it's, it's, it's composed of parser, a control block, and the debarser. The parser is responsible for uh, reading the incoming packet and uh, filling the shared header, header structure. This structure would be further used uh, in, in the control block and the debarser. The control block is, uh, is, uh, implements a set of match action tables and what is really unique uh, in comparison to other BPF created uh, backends, uh, um, we, we do support before registers. 
And uh, finally, the departure is responsible for filling the uh, output bucket buffer. Uh, we provide uh, a predefined uh, set of uh, external objects, uh, so except for uh, registers, the uh, hash functions, and checksum computationals. Uh, however, this predefined uh, set of extents can be not enough uh, for some uh, use cases. And in this situation, we implemented a brand new feature, which is called custom C extern. And this feature allows uh, users to um, define their own uh, functions uh, in the C language, pass them to the C language compiler, and then call, it, uh, call them from the P4 program. And thanks to that, uh, some new exciting use cases can be uh, implemented. For example, we implemented a stateful firewall based on that. And let me show uh, now how we used and how we integrated uh, the, the compiler with a real world uh, software switch. We have proven the usability of the, the, the compiler by designing a solution called uh, P4RT OBS. Uh, this is the extension of OpenVC, which allows. Uh, uh, to extend the packet processing pipeline of OBS at runtime using the P4 language. Basically, we integrated the BPA virtual machine with a user space data pack of, of OpenVSwitch. And thanks to that, we provide a programming, work, programming workflow for OpenVSwitch so, uh, <coughs> so that a user can write a P4 program, mm -hmm. inject it to the uh, user space data path, and invoke uh, the program as the OpenVSwitch action. With this extension, we have implemented uh, uh, we have implemented several use cases. Uh, for example, GTP protocol, PPoE tunneling, or even a stateful firewall using registers. And we are uh, also uh, implementing now a, a support for inbound network telemetry. As some kind of summary, I would like also to present a comparison between between different BPF related backends. Starting from the eBPF, it's uh, the most limited one because it's just a packet filter, but uh, P4C XDP goes further and uh, it, it implements uh, uh, so more advanced features like uh, packet modifications, uh, tunneling, or packet forwarding. Uh, our eBPF backend uh, inherits most of these functionalities. Mm, and as I said, what is really unique, we do provide uh, support for P4 registers. However, uh, we didn't implement the counters, uh, support for the, for the counters, so this is still the work to be done. Okay, so uh, let's sum it up. Uh, we really encourage the community to give our compiler a try and provide us your feedback or new platforms where P4C uh, UBPF can be used. Uh, there is still a, an open problem because uh, the UBPF VM is not standardized uh, in co uh, contrary to UBPF. And there are different flavors of the VM, so that uh, there is no guarantee that our compiler will work with all of them. Uh, as a future work, uh, we plan to enhance the P4 compiler with support for, uh, for counters, for example. Mm. There is still a, a lot of room to optimize the performance of the C code generated from the P4 language. And finally, we really uh, want to uh, design a new and uh, design and implement a new P4 uh, runtime switch based on the UBPF and uh, the high performance solutions uh, such as F, XDP, or DPDK. So I think it's uh, it's really possible with, uh, with this uh, with this compiler. And finally, as this 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 is the uh, panel discussion, I would like also to raise an open question: uh, How far are we from the industry grade and production ready implementation of the P4 software switch? Uh, because, in my opinion, uh, P4 really needs the same uh, for. Uh, I mean, we need we as a community we really need the same for P4 as uh, Open switch was for OpenFlow, and I think we are not uh, there yet. But this is the uh, this is the work to be done. So thank you for the attention. Thanks, Tomas. Is it time we should I should unmute myself now? I think so. I think so. I think we shall start our videos. Fire them up. Thanks, guys. That was, uh, I think I think I was right. We, we, we should have done yours after mine because uh, uh, those were great. I'm like, thanks. <laughs> <laughs>
So I, I had, uh, uh, I don't know if you guys were thinking of questions for, for, for each other, but uh, I, I had a couple of questions for you guys if you wanted to maybe kick off some discussion that way. Sure. Um, so uh, Eric in particular, I guess uh, just to sort of, um, I, I think I, I may have missed it in your introduction, but I guess I, I was trying to mentally picture myself in, let's say, the big picture, the place of some, let's say, somebody operating a big, a big data center, and they want it to be P4 programmable. They like the ability to say, here's what I, the way I wish my data plane would work. For some reason, I guess, the, the idea is maybe they, they don't necessarily want to, uh, maybe they don't want to buy a Tofino, or they don't want to buy a, I don't know, I don't, whatever the reasons might be. Maybe they already have a large installed base, and they don't want to throw it away. That'd be another, uh, I guess, industry, uh, very, very valuable case. But they wish they didn't have to read a big, whole, huge, complex spec. They wish they had this P4 program that they developed that's well matched with some control plane software that does just what they needed to do and no more. So that they can, they, as long as one person goes off and reads that specs and give them gives them the precise behavior of that device that's in their network, they don't need to read it all. Your your tool will kind of figure out where the nooks and crannies are that they can take advantage of it and make it look like what they wish it were. Well, I think an another another idea is that you don't want to have to rewrite your control software Definitely. for every new upgrade, right? Yep. So a lot of, and a lot of the times you end up having to do this. And so uh, I think a lot of the times what happens is you have a specific, say, fabric.p4 program, and you have a bunch of, you have sort of a myriad hardware, and you have a bunch of P4 programs that are maybe optimized for different Tofino versions or optimized for different kinds of programmable hardware and you want to but they're all intended to implement the same functionality this is the case at, uh, that ha is happening at the ONF uh, you have a bunch of different sort of p4 Tofino p4 Broadcom p4 you know Mellanox and uh, you want to synthesize this automatically so you synthesize basically these optimizations automatically without having to modify your control code sure yep no, one thing, I, one thing I will bore people to tears with, given my experience at Cisco, is control plane software is, is easily 100, if not 1,000 times bigger than most data plane code. And, it's, yeah. and, it, and it has a correspondingly large number of developers and salaries to pay to keep it maintained and adding features to it and debugging it and supporting it. So, uh, yeah, uh, I don't want to uh, downplay P4, uh, but, but it is a small number, a fraction of developers that tend to, to, to be in that, direct, that side of the things. Sorry, go ahead, Tomas. Uh, yeah, yeah, I would agree with uh, with you that you know this is a really advantage of this solution that you don't need to rewrite your control plane application. Mm -hmm. So, but my concern is, what about if the uh, switch is not programmable? So, if you have uh, some you know island uh, in, in your network which is which is a you know, typical switch, can you yeah. use your solution? Yeah. So, if you have sort of a, a, a I don't want to use the pejorative term legacy, but if you have sort of these old style, uh, uh, not SDN style portions of your network that you want to manage, that's a bit tricky. You, you, you kind of already don't have this software defined networking uh, architecture. And so those are those kind of become black boxes in your, in your SDN controller code anyway. And so as long as the portion of the network that's controlled by the software defined networking is implement, the software defined network is uh, implementing the same function in your abstract now in your abstraction as it is on your physical devices which you know our algorithm does uh, then it should just be the same as 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 you would expect otherwise mm -hmm. I, yeah. I imagine it works best if um, the the p4 program that you wish it worked like and and hopefully can work like is I mean obviously it needs to be a subset of what it's capable of and the smaller the subset it's the smaller the subset it is the more likely and the, and the faster it will be able to find a way to yes. make it make it work like that. Yes, exactly. So uh, more, wiggle this room, does, more wiggle room helps. <laughs> mm -hmm. This does work best if the physical device is more expressive than the abstract device, yeah. the abstract switch. It has to be at uh, least as expressive. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Otherwise, if the if the abstract switch is is more expressive and you end up writing code that you, that leverages that increased expressiveness, then you end up uh, your, your insertions will fail. Sure. Sure. Um, and uh, this is sort of true of any architecture that's built on this abstract switch, uh, abstract and physical switch like Trellis or, or Stratum or, or Onos. Um, but, but I think I would, I would probably say that, yeah, people with experience at maybe one or a few different vendors, legacy switch yeah. ASICs, probably have an idea of, oh, I can write this P4 program and it will be, you know, this, 
this half of that chip and that quarter of that chip and oh, it's not even going to stretch the capabilities of that one. Right. So exactly. therefore they can probably stay maybe a healthy distance away from the boundary. That's, that's without a lot of trouble. Right. So that's the engineering that's required in, yep. in doing this. So okay. uh, it's future proof in the sense that you don't have to design like Java code. Or, or, or whatever, but you do, there is some engineering work that's required to pick the right abstraction and to pick for, in, uh, for the abstract switch uh, in order to support the physical switches that you have. Yeah, yeah. And I imagine, um, and there was nothing else I was just on the tip of here. Go ahead, if you have another question, I'll see if I can remember what my other question was. But, oh, I remember what it is now. The, uh, have you thought about um, the idea of, let's say, pre-qualifying a new, a, a new generation of, uh, switch comes out and, you went, and you've got your P4 program you've been using, and now you wanna know, is there a chance in heck that this thing is gonna make me happy? I mean, obviously you can just run it in the lab and try it out. That's mm -hmm. certainly, and you'd always wanna do that to, mm -hmm. before you actually put, make it live. Is there maybe some other way you thought of, of uh, any of this technology might, might be able to say, yeah, yeah this, this can definitely do um, this subset yeah. of useful things that yeah, you so need? There, there are some techniques um, in, a, in, a, in a P4, program, you can kind of decompose it into two pieces. Uh, there's kind of the classifier, and there's the set of operations that are executed. And a lot of times, this classifier gets distributed across a lot of tables, and actions are, are uh, operated on sort of, or are uh, chosen based on these subclassifiers. But you can combine them all up into a big classifier and uh, a big uh, sequence of actions based on that single classifier if you want. And so you can do some things like uh, checking to see if all of the action paths, all possible action paths, have a possible action path in the, in the, in the physical switch. Um, or you can do stuff like, does the classifier, you know, uh, obviously if the logical switch or the, the abstract switch has IPv6 and the physical switch doesn't, then, you know, that's, that's automatically you're gonna say, okay, well, don't do this. Like, th yep. this is not compatible. Um, and so there are things like that, that you can do, but I don't, I don't yet have sort of a full story about, or, or a full sort of uh, mm -hmm. certification that you can run that says, yes, this physical switch is compatible with this abstract switch, that sort of. But, but lab testing is, would always be done anyway, and, and that's really a good, you've yeah, got so, an answer for that. Exactly, so you can, you can um, because you don't have the sort of dynamic uh, uh, network that you do in sort of, a, when you're trying to debug networks with sort of, uh, trace route or something like this, you or ping testing, you actually have the, these concrete programs that are not going to change. And you can basically, I mean, if you really wanted to, you could enumerate lots of different characteristic kinds of, of, of rules that you might want to insert. And so you could sort of explore the possible space of all of these, uh, uh, of, of all of the insertions you might want to insert sort of in the lab. Yeah, you could do that. And that would, that would I think that would give you a good confidence that all of your translations would work. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks. So I have a question for, I guess it's kind of both for uh, Andy and for Tomas. Um, uh, Andy, you had, you had talked about uh, sort of future features um, into in P4, like uh, loops and sort of more generics and these kinds of things that start to make, make uh, P4 look a little bit more like, uh, like C, C++, right? Just yep. sort of pushing the boundary of this kind of expressiveness. And uh, Tomas, you talked about in eBPF, you have, uh, I mean, in, in, in eBPF, you have sort of this termination verifier. Um, and I imagine, is that also the case in, in eBPF? I don't actually know. Yeah, there is yeah. a little bit less complex, but uh, there is, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I guess it seems like there's this kind of tension in both of these situations between adding expressiveness uh, and adding these sort of more advanced capabilities while still maintaining the, the, the like uh, basic roots that have enabled like the work that I'm doing, uh, easy encodings into logic uh, that sort of make P4 sort of very attractive as an interface. So do you have thoughts about like how to how to balance this sort of simplicity that's latent in P4 with the, the desire to give programmers these sort of more advanced features? So I do have, um, I mean, one basic thought there is um, it would require, like in order to avoid maybe uh, you know, sort of confusing people too much. Well, I mean, one way would be, um, I don't know if there's other languages that have this, but sort of, uh, 
like Racket as a uh, sort of research teaching language that has sort of different, they have a teaching subset and they have a, you know, mm -hmm. a full developers set. Mm -hmm. And you can just set a flag at the beginning of your code and say, I want the teaching subset and I, or I want, you know, give me the full power. I'm a wizard. I know what I'm doing. Um, one could imagine, I, th I think, one could imagine perhaps putting loops in this sort of, you know, the, the, mm -hmm. The, the, the outer Matryoshka doll, not the inner core subset that everybody supports. Um, and if that set of divisions, you know, the extra power, but requires more of the target uh, could be limited to like a fairly easily separable subset. It's not like this combination of seven things. It's like mm -hmm. you use this or this or this, you're in the bigger set. If you don't use any of those, you're in the smaller subset. I think there's probably a way to organize things that way. Like this is the, that, that might make it like there's two sets, not three or 17, that would avoid confusing people and still let you, you know, know when you're easily in the core or not. That's that's the, the first answer I've thought of that question. Yeah. My point of view is as follows. Uh, first of all, uh, we redeveloped the P4 to user space in PF compiler because uh, we, we wanted to provide users uh, much more generic, much more high-level language than the CEs, right? For for, for the users, so uh, uh, I really like that uh, P4 is quite limited in, in a set of features, and I would really prevent people from growing the feature set of of P4 because, you know, in my opinion, the the simplicity is the beauty, <laughs> and. and sure. uh, I, I I'm not I am a bit afraid to to uh, grow the feature set of the language. But I was surprised that you didn't mention a program, programmable quality of service that uh, was around uh, some time ago. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, um, Steve Abanez at Stanford has done quite a bit of work on that. And um, yeah. right, I should have, I should have mentioned, I'll mention his name now, Steve Abanez. <laughs> <laughs> he's a great guy and he's done a lot of amazing work that, uh, yeah, looking at things, uh, uh, sort of traffic management, drop policies, uh, programmable uh, queue scheduling, things like that. Uh, yeah. Yes, th that's definitely uh, a feature that I see probably, you know, first coming into FPGAs probably because they're the flexibility of those targets. But uh, I, I think a lot of the ideas that he's been working on are, are uh, you know, potentially coming in, you know, could, could be use, could be implementable in, you know, lower cost per port targets as well mm -hmm. in the network. And uh, yeah, that's definitely an area. I'm not even sure, that, I, I suppose there could be some areas there where some language enhancements could be useful. A lot of it that I've seen that I'm familiar with of that work is actually more like creating a new architecture in P416, um, where it's, it's uh, you know, changing the, the ins and outs of different pieces, but the core of the language mostly remains the same. Um, yeah, and, and I, I, I agree with you that on, on the, the worry of the language getting too large. I, um, even on a possible future, putting loops in there, like you can easily, there are cases of, you know, loops that have compile time bounded maximum number of iterations. Like you can tell a compile time that the maximum iterations is eight, even though it might be any number up to eight. Loop unrolling and things like that is uh, basically a way of just cutting down on repetitiveness of a few kinds of code would be one way to introduce it without scaring you as much. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, because even, even on the face of it, like, the parser itself on the face uh, could go forever, right? If you had an infinite packet, the parser could yep. feasibly, in many cases, go on forever. But it's bounded because the data that we have is is bounded. Yep. It's it's you know packets have a there's an MTU it networks and packets don't go beyond some size and eventually you know if, even if your parser is written wrong, it's going to go on forever and consume the rest of the packet. Yep. So yep. I wonder yep. if in adding other language features like like loops, we could sort of mimic this kind of uh, boundedness inherent in the in in the, the domain right it, we have finite gas basically yeah yeah no that there's um i mean i think there's also other languages like um uh, i used to do hardware design and there's a widely used language verilog uh for that mm -hmm. and the last time i used it professionally was over 20 years ago now so i my, my knowledge but shortly after i stopped using professionally they started they started enhancing language for things like uh, loops and other kinds of things mm -hmm. that, you know, they, they were compile time maximum known numbers and they unrolled the gates, <laughs> you know, basically right. just copied more gates. 
um, but they did make it. I mean, basically everybody before that point was had their own homegrown Perl, Python, mm. mingled version of language that like ran the Python program that generated your Verilog program. And some tricks like that are done, being done with P4 today because of these similar kind of limitations. So I can, mm -hmm. Verilog, looking at what it happened there might be a, a, a path to um, extending the language without going crazy. <laughs> right, yeah. So another thing that I was wondering is, uh, Andy, you mentioned this idea of modularity also in your talk, uh, which I think is something that, that uh, I really want in P4. <laughs> um, and it would also help the kinds of things that I'm doing, uh, because if I could, you know, synthesize one piece uh, and map it to another module, like if I could synthesize modules to each other, uh, that would greatly speed up the, the translation. Some of it could even be potentially offline. Like uh, this kind of modularity not only helps things that I'm doing, but also programmers. It, it's convenient to reuse code in lots of situations. Mm -hmm. um, and it seems like lots of obviously general purpose languages have this. And so I was wondering if you could talk about some of the challenges that are specific to P4 with, with these uh, yeah. module systems. So, so I mean, uh, like the first one that comes to mind is um, the, a common thing that comes, a question that comes up is in C, for example, you compile .c files separately to .o and then there's a linker step to combine those all together. Um, and I guess in some cases they even do, they'll, they'll even do whole program optimization after that as sort of an optional fancy extra feature that, that you have to get a special compiler to that's really done the extra, gone the extra mile to implement something like that. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, at least for uh, switch ASIC targets and a lot, a lot of targets, that's sort of like whole program optimization or whole program analysis, stitching it all together first, and then you really do the actual compiling. So, I mean, you could think of like, oh, well, compiling the .c is really just like turning it into some parse tree format, and then you combine them together, and then you do the real compilation all together. Um, so, I mean, the, when, when I say modularity, I, I, it seems to mean a lot of, it's a, very, it's a very nebulous word that can mean a lot of different things to different people and which programming languages they're familiar with. Um, some of the simplest aspects of it are just, I want to have, to be able to import this file and not have its names mess up my names. Mm -hmm. That's like the simplest sort of separation that doesn't provide any, but the generics are a kind of thing, like the ability, like say, the ability to do, I want this thing to be an, an access control list block but I want to be able to instantiate once for v4, IPv4, and once for IPv6, and maybe once for Ethernet or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, those are the things that I think are closer to the data plane um, core use cases that somebody might like to test and verify that thing once and then just know that, okay, they're the same except for the address sizes. Um, I'm sure there are other use cases that I'm not thinking of at the top of my head, and you might have some. And uh, I think it, it, when growing the language, I think it's, it's definitely good to, to you know, focus on it on its the core use cases and not try to definitely look at other programming languages for inspiration, but but then kind of rein in what they <laughs> right. in many cases what they what they uh, have achieved. Right. Yeah. Like my background is is functional programming, so I'm I'm you know Haskell with like it's 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 yep. uh, let polymorphism and and mm -hmm. OCaml with its like robust module system, and so I, I, I love Lisp flavored languages yeah. like like. Common Lisp and closure and scheme, but but yeah, the, the, I was really joking about the garbage collection. <laughs> <laughs> right. was nice. I was really struggling to get the screen face for five seconds. <laughs> right. So those those the, obviously those kinds of things are are trickier to add and probably won't necessarily work the way that you want in in P four. Um, yeah, in my opinion, you know, is is much better in P four sixteen than in P four fourteen. Yeah, I mean, I mean the modularity <laughs> because you can import some things, etc. Uh, but in my opinion, what really would be needed for the for the language is some kind of uh, set of libraries that we can reuse. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, for example, you, you need to redefine uh, over and over the, the set of uh, IPv6 headers or, or IPv4 headers, Ethernet headers in every program, right? So that would be nice to have it, have it in some central repository and you can just fetch it uh, on demand, right? So. That would be nice, in my opinion. That 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 we could do without a module system, I think, and, and is worth worth doing uh, worth doing already. Uh, and you're reminding me that yeah, that's been brought up more than once. <laughs> so like a like an OPAM for uh, for P4 is what you're suggesting, kind of. Oh, I'm just thinking of like a big header file that it defines every oh. networking header anybody's ever used 
and maybe a right. few you've never even heard of. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah. it, 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 just, just to standardize the names across right. programs so that, I mean, the names, are, likely nobody cares deeply about the names of fields and things like that. There are some, even some cases there though, I've heard of that particular targets, there's like details like, oh, do you make this field one eight bit thing or do you make it a two and a six bit mm -hmm. field thing because there's a substructure there. Mm -hmm. So even there, that's the main sticking right. point sometimes to something that looks very obvious that ought to be or done yesterday. Sometimes people will parse the, the ether type in, in different headers as, as appropriate. The beginning or the end, the next yeah, or the exactly. end of the last one, yeah. Exactly. It's always the end of the last one. That's the right way to do it. I mean, anybody that does it the other way is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, I mean, <laughs> I thought that was subtle. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, I, I did do a quick time check here. I think we are I think uh, we're we have time. Yeah. Close to the end. yeah. Um, thank you very much. It was a great thank talking you. to you. And uh, stay safe. Stay healthy <laughs> and stay uh, productive. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yep. Take care. Bye bye.